Welcome back to yet another week of Behind the Lens. I'm Debbie Elias, film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens, where we go behind the lens and below the line with all those movers and shakers, the film and TV makers, the producers, the directors, the writers, the actors, the cinematographers, production designers, costume designers, visual effects wizards, uh, sound mixers, sound editors, film editors, composers, authors, you name it, we talk to them. Now, if you're tuning in today, and if you're watching on the Adrenaline Radio Facebook page, you'll see I'm not in my chair in the studio. That's because I am staving off, hopefully getting rid of, uh, this bout of bronchitis that I've been battling for a couple weeks now, so that I can be in studio to embarrass Pam next week on her birthday. I don't want to come in, I didn't want to come in today uh, and get her sick so that she would be sick on her birthday. So always thinking of Pam, who is our wonderful sound engineer. So I've got this great pre-recorded show for you with two incredible interviews, two directors whose work I greatly admire. And if you're not familiar with the one, uh, the director of Operation Napoleon, Take a look at his latest film, and I think you're going to get on board and want to see more of his work. And then we have a brand new first-time feature director talking about his feature directorial, Red, White, and Royal Blue. The interesting thing about both of these films, they're both based on, on best-selling books. Uh, our first film we're going to talk about today is Operation Napoleon, and it is a thriller. Uh, it is directed by Oscar Thor Axelson, and it is written by Arnoldor Indroesen and Martin Thorison, based on Arnoldor's best-selling book that I believe came out in 8990. I read the book when it first came out, and it was riveting. The film star it's an international cast, uh, Vivian Olaf's Deter. I'm not good with my Icelandic, sorry. Jack Fox, Ian Glenn, and a gentleman you may not know his name, but when you see him on screen, you'll know him. Olafur Dari Olafsson, who played the wall in The Meg of a couple years ago. He is not returning in Meg to the trench because he, of course, got eaten by the Meg in the first film. But he was wonderful there, if that was your first uh, introduction to, to Olafur. He is equally wonderful here in Operation Napoleon. This is the tale of Icelandic lawyer Kristen, who is drawn into the vortex of an international conspiracy when she receives footage of an airplane wreck from her brother. And that footage recently revealed the melting of one of Iceland's largest glaciers and uncovered was an old German World War II plane. There's a lot of people looking for this plane, not the least of which are the Americans, CIA director William Carr, and everyone else you can possibly think of. They have long wanted to remove this wreck because there is allegedly something hidden within it, known as Napoleon, Operation Napoleon. Um, and Kristen... She doesn't care, really, about the riddle of Operation Napoleon. She wants her brother. She wants to find her brother and get him back. And along with her, joining her, uh, is an old friend a, named Steve. Of course, a local Icelandic gentleman, played by Olafur Olafsson, Einar, who, you're going to love this character, people, I'm telling you. He ends up uh, assisting as well in this quest. And their biggest enemy 
is CIA Director Carr, who is brilliantly played by Ian Glenn. Um, just, and there's this incredible performance from Julie Radoff, who plays Carr's right-hand um, mercenary, shall we say. The film, what makes this film so spectacular is that it is shot on location in Iceland on one of the biggest glaciers in Iceland that apparently has never been shot for in a film before. Um, pristine, perfect. But as you'll hear Oscar talk about, one of the problems when you're shooting on a glacier or in snow, but particularly with a glacier because of the glistening coat that you get on top of it, is shooting white on white on white on white. And that can drive you crazy, especially for your cinematographer, in this case, Arnie Phil uh, Philipson. But these two give us the most beautiful visual tonal bandwidth and visual palette shooting on the glacier for the bulk of the film and the play of light the reflections, refractions, the shadows that you try and find. It's all absolutely stunning visually. And it really helps fuel the story and the danger. Judiciously using widescreen, uh, especially on the exteriors, because it really gives us a sense of isolation. And that nobody's going to come help you when you're out there. And if somebody is out there to do harm, well, nobody's going to come look for them either. Beautifully balanced with interiors uh, on Kristen's search with one breadcrumb after another that takes us into the waters as well as some beautifully constructed sets, including the German World War II plane and its entire interior. Absolutely, the attention to detail is amazing, and it just draws you in even more. And Oscar and I discuss everything, from the casting to the cinematography, to the importance and what it means to be the first to be shooting on this glacier, and also the adaptation of the script from the film. Because the script is where it's present day versus the book when it came out in 89 or 90. So drone technology wasn't what it is. Global warming wasn't as much in the media and in the zeitgeist as it is. But all of that is now brought in to this very current script that then perfectly interweaves the history of World War II and this particular Operation Napoleon. One of the fun things you're going to hear Oscar talk about in this interview are snow whisperers. And I'm not going to tell you what they are. You're going to have to listen and find out for yourself. The film is absolutely wonderful. It hits select theaters and is on VOD this week on August 11. I can't recommend it highly enough. If you want a good thriller, if you want a slow burn... And if you've read the book, this stops at a certain point in the book and we're set up for a fabulous sequel, which Oscar um, hints we, we might very well be getting. So without any further ado, I'll stop gabbing and take a listen to Oscar Thor Axelson talking about Operation Napoleon. Hi, Oscar. Hi, Debbie. How are you doing? I'm very happy to be speaking with you this morning. I always love a good thriller. And what makes a thriller even better for me is if it's something that ties back to World War I or World War II, uh, which is exactly what you've done here. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I love those thrillers. <laughs> They're set in current day based on the past and you take us back to the past and you pepper it the pacing on this film oscar really impresses me because 
we you keep us in suspense almost the entire film as to what Operation Napoleon is. I absolutely love that. So when we get a reveal, it was like, oh my God, now I want another movie. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Thank you. This is, I know, shooting in Iceland is nothing new for you, but shooting on a glacier may be. This is one of the most stunning aspects of the film, but also from a filmmaking standpoint, it had to be the most challenging, shooting out there on the glacier. Talk to me about working with your cinematographer and your crew with all of this exterior footage out on the glacier, because that also pre it presents challenges logistically, I'm sure, just to get there, but also... Yeah. In the actual filming, because white on white on white, but you've got light that will reflect off of there. Walk me through some of those obstacles and challenges that you had to face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely correct with the uh, white on white. I mean, I guess that's, that's uh, one of the biggest challenges when you when you start because you go to the glacier and it's just white on white, and it's uh, it's kind of hard to shoot. Uh, so when we first started scouting, and this is maybe maybe six, seven, eight months before we we, we shot the movie, we we we, we found this. We, so we we, were, we had like these guides that are that, that that will take people on tours on the glacier, right? Mm -hmm. And we told the place they had just discovered, and it was a uh, it was actually a cave that they found, that they discovered. There was a lake there in the middle of the glacier, and. Uh, and then the, 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 the glacier had uh, swallowed up the lake, so the lake had disappeared, and, and underneath it was a glacier. And um, so, they, so they took us there to show us the glacier, and then when we got, it was like a, it's like a bowl, and when you get into the bowl and you look around, you will see these kind of ice, uh, uh, what should I call it, like, like, they're almost like cliffs or, or, or like big rock formations that are made of ice, but they are... But they have all these colors in them. They're, they're like dark colored, you know, dark blue. Even though they're ice, because it used to be a lake. Mm -hmm. So it gives you detail and definition that you, that you won't get anywhere else on the glacier. So you really either get mountains that will give you details, or this. And, uh, and this is the, you know, there's, there's only one other place in, uh, in Iceland, you know, where the, where the other glaciers are that we knew of that had this kind of formation. And that place was, was kind of impossible to get to unless you have a helicopter uh, to, 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 to take everybody under all the equipment. So we kind of decided, all right, let's, uh, let's shoot here. And we also looked at this cave, which was outstanding, unbelievable cave. Uh, so I really want to shoot there. And uh, it, it's dangerous, but, it, you know, it's doable. And then when we when it came to shooting, the cave had disappeared. It was just, you know, full of water and ice and they're almost gone, you know, so, oh, so we had to abandon that. But these formations were there. And uh, and so it was, it, it, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it's why we picked the place, because you have definition. And then the, another kind of bonus uh, for that location, because it's kind of a ball, it gives you a little bit better chance of having, uh, uh, not, uh, you know, a storm the whole time, because you're in a little bit of a ball. So it, so it can be a little bit quieter down there, you know. So that's another reason we picked that. Uh, that being said, when we when we were you know when we were trying to scout the place and you know take the crew for tech reggies and such, you know, when we were preparing the movie, we couldn't really go because there was never any uh, visibility. Oh wow! So we so we ended up kind of just rolling the dice, and you know, and then when it finally came, you know, like in the middle of the shoot, you know, we you know it. it it becomes the time when we have to go to the glacier for a few days to shoot. We were like, all right, we just have to go and hope for the best, you know. And we didn't, you know, it was hard to have a contingency plan, really, because you, we have to just shoot these things that take place there. And uh, and when you're there, you know, you're staying in a hotel nearby, but it still takes you two hours to get there and two hours to go down, so that's already four hours of your day, you know. Uh, and uh, and you just move so slowly, you know. Your uh, big vehicles move slowly, and uh, and then you kind of on ski do just trying to rush around and you know do your thing, get your shots done. Uh, but we we, yeah, we kind of lucked out for uh, for big 
Mm-hmm. But people are still realizing at the same time, oh, we're, we're going to remember this fondling. It's going to, this is kind of a magical place, you know. So we had that there. It, it looks magical on screen, I have to tell you. And the fact that you and your DP, Arnie, you go, you keep us pretty much in widescreen when we are out on the glacier. So we really get the sense of isolation and grandeur and almost the quiet of a cemetery, which I thought was very striking. And of course, as we learn very quickly, it is essentially a cemetery of some sort for a Nazi war plane. Yeah. Now, did you do, was that um, CGI'd in the plane parts, or did you actually have your production designer build pieces of the plane to set in the snow? created for us. Um, we, we, I think we created three different planes. You know, we had to create one, but, you know, that's not the whole plane, and not, not the whole fuselage that we took to the glacier. And then we did the interior, which we had to shoot in, a, in like a frozen, uh, like a freezer uh, uh, container, you know, just to, to, to get the, uh, you know, all the, um, all the breathing and all the uh, kind of mentioned something fun that I know a lot of people don't think about when they're watching a film, but when you have these pristine areas and you're having to do, you know, one take, two take, three take, you do have to have somebody that goes and covers up all the tracks that have been made in the snow so that you can get a clean shot for the second take, third take, or whatever. So I really like the fact that you're acknowledging that, yes, we had to clean the tracks up. were you with the book on which this is based? The book is fantastic. I read it, I don't remember how long ago. Yeah. But it's a, a while. But you also, this doesn't go as far as the book goes in terms no, of a timeline. No, no, I know, yeah. I mean, the, 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 I, I did read the book when it was published. Uh, this is 25 years ago, you know. So I, I read the book, uh, and this is before I went to film school. I, had, I was doing working in commercials at the time, but I was so uh, blown away by the book, and I really wanted to, I thought it would be a good movie, so I, so I just kind of got up the courage to call the publisher, you know, even though I hadn't really done any films or anything like that, and I asked for the rights, but the rights were gone at the time, you know, so, okay, all right, um, and then, you know, uh, 20 years later, the book comes back to me through the producer that, that had the rights at that time, um, and I was like, of course, I mean, yeah, I can't believe that. I mean, this is a book I really liked and remember quite well. Um, and I was mainly, I, I was most excited to see, okay, so what have they done? Because they had been developing it for a while. Um, and I was very excited to see, is it going to be a 
Mm -hmm. entails, or and that base moved in uh, 2004 or five, or has it been has it been modernized? Has it been updated? Um, and then I, you know, well, then it, there was obviously the solution, and uh, and I was quite happy with uh, kind of how how that turned out, and then and it kind of added a layer that I like a lot, which is to speak about the conditions of the glaciers. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I love that climate, the whole climate change issue that's brought in here, and it really yeah. helps fuel the story. But I mean, I, I I do like that it's, that it's a part of the story. Yeah, and it's an important part, you know, even though it's a background thing, really. Got an amazing cast here, a very international cast, I might add. How challenging was it to to cast this film? I have to ask about the editing process on this one, Oscar, because it is so important to find that right pace, especially in a thriller, to build and build and build our anticipation. How challenging was the editing process for you? How time consuming was it to find the pacing of this one? Have a favorite moment in this film that you're particularly proud of? The glacier stuff is spectacular. But Thank you. Visually, it is stunning. And then the entire film, it's it's just a great slow burn roller coaster ride. And I want a sequel, Oscar. I want a sequel. Yeah, we're, we're, we're planning it. <laughs> Yay! Well, Oscar, thank you so, so much. This has been wonderful getting to speak with you, and I hope we get to do it again in the future. Likewise, Debbie. Good talking to you. 
Canal, a film I am absolutely crazy about. Red, White, and Royal Blue. This is so much fun. It is light, bright, refreshing. It just, it, it's believable, it's flirtatious, it's charming. There is nothing about the lightness and breeziness of this film that you aren't going to love. It's the kind of film that we really need to just lighten the whole mood at this point in the summer uh, with politics heating up, with the SAG and the WGA strikes. Let's take our mind off of everything with this great, fun film directed by Matthew Lopez. Written by Matthew and Ted Malawar based on the bestseller, Casey McQuiston's bestseller of the same name. The cast is outstanding, but it's led by two of the most incredible young actors out there today. Nicholas Galitzine and Taylor Zachar, uh, Zachar Perez. And supplemented with an amazing supporting cast. Uma Thurman is the President of the United States. Clifton Collins, J Collins Jr. is the first husband. Stephen Fry is the King of England. And then some excellent performances from Sarah Shockeye, Ellie Bamber. On, it's just amazingly well done. And the premise of this wonderful story is Alex Claremont Diaz, played by Taylor Perez, is the son of the President of the United States. And Britain's Prince Henry, who is in line to the throne, and is played by Nicholas Galadzine, uh, they're very similar. They have a lot in common. Stunning good looks, charisma, international popularity, and they hate each other. Separated by an ocean, their long-running feud hasn't really been an issue until a very disastrous and public altercation at a royal wedding is picked up by the tabloids everywhere and goes viral everywhere. And this causes a dangerous wedge between U.S.-British relations uh, on the eve of the president trying to negotiate a major deal with Great Britain. But, as I'm sure that you have figured out already, with these two sniping at each other and hating each other, it really works as foreplay to what becomes a tentative friendship, then a great friendship, and ultimately a relationship that you can't help but root for. This film made me smile from beginning to end. Made my heart smile. Um, just a joy. Now, one of the big coups of Red, White, and Royal Blue is that Ma Matthew um, snagged cinematographer Stephen Goldblatt for this film. Stephen Goldblatt really keeps the visual tonal bandwidth and the emotional tonal bandwidth light and bright and, again, breezy. You know Stephen Goldblatt's work. You may not know his name, but he was a cinematographer on a few films that you may know. Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, For the Boys, a big favorite of mine. Not the box office, but a big personal favorite of mine. Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, the intern, the help, working with Tate Taylor. Goldblatt's work is always exemplary, and it is here as well. Joining, adding to the first-rate production values is the work of the editors, Christina Hetherington, who cut The Wonder and The Duke, Roger Michelle's final film. And in hand in hand with Christina is Nick Moore, who is responsible for About a Boy, The Full Monty, Morning Glory, and Tarsum Singh's Mirror Mirror. Everything. Just so well done. Great balance of the humor. There's plenty of heart, warmth, 
The only problem I have is that we get a couple false endings. It almost felt like they weren't quite sure how to end it, but it works. That's my only, my only comment that's slightly negative is about the ending is very tentative because they could have stopped at one point. Well, then they could have stopped at the next one and then ultimately they did. Any of them would have worked the way they have, they have done it works, but you're going to love watching this cast. Just sit back and enjoy the film when you see it. It is also available this Friday, August 11th on Prime Video. But right now, sit back and enjoy my exclusive interview with director Matthew Lopez. Hey, Matthew. Hi, how are you? I am so excited to be talking with you about Red, White, and Royal Blue. I'm excited about you. And Guido, Guido, my publicist, says hello. Uh, well, tell Guido I love him and hello from me. Uh, He's waving right now. Ah, uh, well, I have to say, I had this film is so fun. It's light. It's bright. It's breezy. The uh, it's, the chemistry between Nicholas and Taylor is refreshing, believable, flirtatious, charming. Every minute of this film, I smiled, my heart smiled, and I oh. rooted for these two guys. Just, Thank you. Matthew, just so wonderful. Thank you so much. I can't tell you what a joy it is to see a film that is this light and breezy and bright on every oh, we level. Had so, we had so much fun making it. It was like everything that you are, are responding to was like, you're basically describing what it was like to be on set for those nine weeks. And of course, going out away from your cast here, I want to talk about the cast in a minute, but very importantly, you nailed Stephen Goldblatt as your cinematographer. I did. Uh, <laughs> how did you do that? He was, yeah, he was our secret weapon. Not the secret weapon, I guess. I have just loved Stephen's work over the decades, and I love how he's gone from the darker, more dramatic films and slowly got lighter and lighter in a lot of his tone, such as with the intern, Julian Julia, mm -hmm. even with the help for Tate. Yeah, yeah. So you got him at a perfect time with this great wealth of visual grammar behind him, and you use, yeah. the two of you use it beautifully here. I mean, he was my he was my greatest partner on this thing. Um, Stephen uh, really. I mean, I'm a first time filmmaker, and I have Stephen Goldblatt as my my <laughs> GOP. Like uh, that was that was a blessing, and he really he one. Excuse me. He said something to me very early on in the um, in the pre production process once he had gone to London. And I talked about being an inexperienced filmmaker, and he said to me, he says, you're not an inexperienced filmmaker. You're an unpracticed one, because you are a storyteller, and you have been for a long time. And anything that you don't know about filmmaking, you'll know at the end of the first day. Um, and he really gave me so much encouragement and, and really sort of helped me, helped me succeed. Um, I am very indebted to him. Talk to me about how you and Steven develop the visual grammar that you have because you start off with a bang, literally and figuratively. Um, but with that wedding reception scene, the camera, it keeps moving. It creates energy, and that energy stays with the film. You've got the New Year's Eve, Alex's New Year's Eve party that is, again, it's energetic. The camera is moving, moving, moving. But then you counter that with slow, that third act sequence in the museum is just to die for. It is the most languid and breathtakingly beautiful sequences I have seen on film in a long time. Talk to oh, me about how the two of you develop this visual grammar, because this is what showcases the incredible performances that you have. I told him from the very beginning, I said the danger of a movie like this is that it, it, you, it, in the wrong hand, it could look and then therefore be disposable. I said that this, this because this is a rom-com, because this is based on a YA novel, uh, the temptation on the, the hands of some would be to 
just sort of make it seem a little plasticky and, and dashed off. And I said, what these, what these two boys deserve, and especially because of the world, the two sort of high-level worlds that they inhabit, I said, what we really need to do is, is create a richness around them. We need to create a sense that um, it, with the photography that, that this, is a, this is a really uh, expensive and high-level uh, sort of world that they're, they're living in. And, and, and what, the, what Stephen and I also discussed a lot was just my, des my desire in looking at these old the screwball comedies from the 1930s and how, how so many of those scenes were, are played in one. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, you, you just, you know, they, the, the, the master shots weren't necessarily there to just establish the, the physical geography of the scene. They were really there to capture great actors loose in space together uh, playing a scene. And so the other thing that, that really, especially in terms of the camera movement, one of the earlier decisions that we made was to try and, and, and to get as many scenes as we can in one. Uh, and then go back for cover to, you know, just because, you know, we're, we're, we're not stupid. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, there are so many, like that scene that you refer to in the, the, in the wedding, um, the camera's always moving because it's roaming, because Alex is roaming. And Alex, we call, I always call that the Amadeus shot because he, <laughs> Taylor always reminded me. He may look like Harry Grant in that scene, but his performance is very Tom Hall. Um, uh, you know, following him around that 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 that, that wedding, um, there's there's a scene uh, where we pull them into the um, we pull them into the banquet at the um, at the, the the state dinner at the at, after they make out in the um, the, oh, the red room, and we just sort of like pull them gently through that that scene, and we actually shot that whole scene in one. Um, there are so many shots in this film that are, are, we got in one. They're, they're my favorite, I think, is actually this, this top shot on a crane over the bed, uh, with Alex and Henry together after they have sex. And Alex is talking about what it's like to be a Mexican American in politics and his hopes for the future. And we started wide and we just gently gently move down until we are in this really tight two shot of them and that was one of the scenes where we got no coverage i i just said the scene is as long as it's going to be it's going to be determined solely on taylor's performance we're gonna we're gonna go until we 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 get something that we really like and i think the hero the hero take of that was take six of maybe eight or nine mm -hmm. um and Stephen and I really spent a lot of time investing in letting those actors be free and not be con confined as, as much as possible by, by coverage. Um, we really, really wanted to just sort of like create a loose and a free space, which, which I think is part of the visual language of the film. Yes. Um, there's also the last thing I would say about working with Stephen too, is because it's always about, but like Stephen knows how to make beautiful images course and he's very good at them and we didn't stint at all in this movie but Stephen is is a storyteller and he he is about character and he's about he is so much about actors and um the other shot the other shot that i really love in the in the movie is a locked off shot um it's under the tree on new year's eve when alex approaches henry from behind and they're both facing us and we are we have henry in the foreground and alex in the background in 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 soft focus mm -hmm. and we shot it we shot close shots of, we got close shots of, of, of Alex but once I saw it that it was just just staying on Henry and just not cutting away and not cutting away the way he composed that shot gives you everything you need in that in that scene and I I, uh, I just I played pretty much the whole scene in that shot without ever cutting away and and um, and the fact that even my editor was looking at it and going, I really can't improve on this. I think Steven did a great job with this. Um, you know, that movie, the movie works in so many ways because Stephen Goldblatt was the director of photography on it. But 
it is it is emotionally beautiful with the what yeah. with what you guys have done with that visual grammar now yeah. got to talk to you about this casting number 1 yeah. nicholas and T- and taylor they are off the charts and i have to say i'm going on record taylor has the best eyelashes in history <laughs> you know i agree with you he had, he he should get them insured uh, yeah <laughs> Betty Grable got her legs insured. I think Taylor needs his eyelashes insured. He needs, uh, uh, yeah, um, and 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 uh, Jimmy Durante got his nose insured. Yeah. So I think Taylor definitely definitely needs to get his his eyelashes insured. They are off the charts. Fit these roles so well, and then you balance that. You bring in Uma Thurman, who makes a perfect president, mind you. She really does, doesn't she? Clifton Collins Jr who is so laid back and an incredible father and first husband. And you couldn't have done any better than casting Stephen for the king. I was beyond overjoyed when he showed up in the third act. But how difficult and challenging was this casting? Because you've got your supporting players as well, such as Zara, you know, Sarah Shockey is excellent. You real. This was a real soup that you had to find the perfect seasoning for. It was. It, I mean, we spent months and months and months and months and months. It was. It, it, and, and in a few few roles, it was down to the wire. Um, but I also knew that, especially when it came to Taylor and Nick, I, until I found those two actors, I didn't have a movie. Sarah Shahi is so great in it, and I was so happy that we had her when we had her. But I also kept saying, if we don't have an Alex and a Taylor, there's nothing for Sarah Shahi to do. And so um, we spent, I think I spent about five months, and I saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of actors for, for these roles, and especially for wow. Alex. And with the role of Alex, most especially, I watched every single self-tape. I didn't have, I didn't have my um, casting director do any uh, whittling down for me. I watched every single self-tape. Um, because I knew that the movie would live or die based on the strength of the casting. And um, then at a certain point in the process, in walks Taylor, and then in walks Nick, and they just, they individually, they just, they made an instant case for themselves that they were the part. And um, after several auditions and work sessions with them, I put them on a Zoom together because we were all in different cities. And their chemistry was just undeniable from the beginning. They just liked each other. I mean, I think the secret to this movie is everybody who made this movie liked each other. And they really wanted to be there. And like from the beginning of the film, the beginning of the rehearsal process, when Nick and Taylor were in a room for the first time, they just liked each other. And they just got on so well. And over the course of filming this movie, I watched these two actors grow as a unit and grow as individuals and i'm just the lucky guy who stumbled upon them and and i'm the lucky guy who had them both be available at the same time um i don't know what this movie looks like without the two of them and i'm glad i don't need to ever know oh i don't ever want to know what it looks like without them because from the minute the two of them are on on, show up on screen we get that instant sniping between the two of them that is just, yes, you know it's foreplay. It plays so well. It's foreplay that's, that's coming to the surface right away. Kind of like... The thing about that first scene is it, we had shot that was about the third week of filming. And so, you know, that's around the time that maybe just the tiniest little bit of fatigue might start to set in. And people, you know, maybe somebody gets on each other's nerves for the first time or whatever. And, and I just... But Nick and Taylor had always just been so cool with each other the whole time and I just said to them fellas I need you to just be nasty I just don't worry that it's the beginning of the movie they'll like you don't worry just be nasty to each other if you can I was so funny because they were pretty nasty to each other and then as soon as we cut they just had to hug each other and like just like dispel that energy and I, I, I actually had a point I said to Taylor I'm like would you stop being so nice to him just for one day for you because the love of God can you just be mean to him and he's like okay It works so well. 
sets the stage for us, but you're hooked. In that moment, you're hooked. And then the fact that we get to see a friendship and then a relationship develop and you make great use of instant messaging Mm, and direct messaging. You make great use of that. It's not overdone. It's not tedious. It's not in our faces. It's very judiciously done, Matthew. Thank you. Well, I knew I had these two actors, so why the hell did I want to spend my time looking at at, at, at graphics too much? Yeah. Like the graphics... The graphics were simply uh, there to sort of enhance things, but and and the gra- I'm really happy with what we ended up doing. But like, I've got these two dynamic, wonderful actors. Let's put them on screen. Let's have them say their lines, their text messages out loud, and let's deliver it. Let's let's deliver it in a way that that we don't usually get to see in a movie. Um, I think that was one of the few decisions I made that really relied on my theater training because, like, when you see a contemporary set play, you don't really the, the audience doesn't really have to. Uh, try too hard to understand that, oh, they're speaking out loud, but they're actually text messaging, or they're speaking out loud, but they're actually on the phone with each other. So we said, let's just apply that to filmmaking and see what happens. Um, I guess it could have gone wrong for me, and I would have really regretted the decision, um, but it, it ended up really working, and I think, again, not to sound like a broken record, it worked because those two guys are just, you know, who wouldn't want to look at them? And who and they're so compelling actors that they they deliver that scene as well. I had one more thing I wanted to ask you, Matthew, about your, your learning oh, let's curve. Do it. Let's do it. I love you too much. Your learning curve. What did you learn with your first directorial feature that you can take forward into your next projects? Honestly, it's a lesson that I learned from Stephen uh, Daldry, and it's a lesson I learned from working with um, Tom Fontana, is that kindness uh, is the the best way to get good work out of people. Kindness uh, is is the key to success in my experience. Well, you got a successful, wonderful film on your hands, Matthew. So if Thank it, you. I if, appreciate it if it's the result of kindness, everybody should be making films this way. Hi, I would I would get behind that. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Thanks, Matthew. Bye-bye. Bye bye. And that is all the time we have today. I will be in studio next week. I have to embarrass Pam on her birthday. Or at least make her feel special. Uh, and starting next week, it's going to, as I said, it's going to get very people Got lots of guests lined up over the coming weeks. And uh, I'm really anxious to speak with them. Some of the films I've already seen. So, and then we'll also be popping in a few pre-recorded interviews as well, because I have a slew of them that I've been working on, all with some great films. So, not the least of which, and this is up on the Behind the Lens Online dot net website already, with director, co-writer, composer Jeremy Zag, and the enchanting. And fun, animated film, Miraculous, Ladybug and Cat Noir, the movie. So make sure you check that out. I might pop that in in the coming weeks um, as part of the show at some point. But you're looking for horror. I am Rage, David Ryan Keith. That interview will be coming soon. My fellow Philadelphian, Mary Patel Gallagher, writer-director of Holliday. And, fun tidbit, Mary, as, we, as I found out, um, as I was prepping to do an interview with her, she actually did a news show in the TV station with my father back in Philadelphia many years ago. So, that was a real joy to speak with her. But her interview is going to be making its way to you as well. And we've got more. But... For right now, mark your calendar for this Friday. Red, White, and Royal Blue, Operation Napoleon. Both winners in my book. And until next week, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens.